In this week's video, I'll show you how I trim and pull the handles on these very fine stoneware cups. These might be some of the most delicate objects that I've ever made, and last week I unpacked my first ever glaze-fired batch. Anyhow, let's begin. I threw the bodies of these cups from 200 grams of high iron stoneware clay, and this is now the day after, and the cups are firm and leather hard, which means they're now ready to trim. And to do this, I use a thrown leather hard chuck, which you've likely seen in some of my previous videos. It's essentially just a solid lump of clay that's roughly thrown to match the interior dimensions of the cup. I simply centre it on the wheel and firmly secure it in place with three lumps of soft clay. I like to keep my chucks leather hard, that way they stick slightly to the pot that's positioned onto them. The top of the chuck is flat and that fits snugly against the flat base of the cup, which means as the base is supported, I can trim it to be very thin without worrying about it deforming as I work. Although the leather hard chuck does help to keep the pot firmly in place, I also use this metal spinner to place on top, which I then apply some downward pressure through, which helps to keep the cup from suddenly leaping up, which it can do as the pressure exerted as you trim can be quite great. But essentially, all I'm doing here is removing a very thin skim of clay from the outside and neatening up the walls. I then use the sharp edge of a metal kidney just to do the same sort of job. It smooths away the turning marks and it also imparts its straight edge onto the form itself. Once the walls are done, I can begin to trim the base. And all I do for these is I remove a slight bevel from the bottom corner before trimming away the wiring off marks, which are still visible in the clay from when I wired off the thrown form from the wheel head. I then use a flat and smooth edge of another metal kidney just to quickly smooth over the base, burnishing it and neatening it too. The last step of trimming is just to stamp in my maker's mark. And again, the chuck comes in handy here because as the base is so thin, when I stamp it, if the chuck weren't there, there's a good chance that the pressure of pushing it in would deform the bottom. So not only does the chuck keep the rim of the pot nice and round, but it also supports the base as I'm trimming. A number of you have asked in the comments about how I throw these chucks. And it may eventually be something I make a video about, but essentially all I do when I'm throwing them is I envisage the interior form of the piece the chuck will fit into, and I throw it quite roughly at the beginning. In fact, it's probably better to make it a little bit larger than needs be initially. Then, once the chuck has turned leather hard and I have pots ready to go onto it, I trim the chuck until it fits the form just right, and that's it really. Thereafter, I just keep it wrapped up in plastic and occasionally I'll dunk the whole thing in water before sealing it away in an airtight box with all my other chucks. Beveling this bottom edge is important, as if you were to leave it as just a sharp corner, the likelihood that it'll chip through use is very high, but it doesn't have to be as strict a bevel as this. You can simply round it or do all matter of things, as long as that sharp, susceptible corner is removed. There is quite a bit of grog in this clay, so by burnishing all I'm doing is I'm pushing in those exposed sharp particles of sand. I do also sand the bases of my pots after they've been glaze fired, because as the clay fires and it shrinks, it recedes around those particles of grog, exposing them again. So I simply sand these away, and that's all. I don't want to ruin the integrity of the rough clay, but removing these sharp points will stop the pots from scratching tables if they happen to be dragged over them. Once finished, I wrap my chuck back up in plastic, and this one I've probably had for about a year now, and it's still just about leather hard. So, with all the cups trimmed, we can move on to the next part of the process, which is pulling their handles. I'm making this batch of cups for an exhibition I'm having at Make, Hauser & Worth in May, and I wanted the handles for them to be exceptionally thin and delicate to match the very thin, fine drinking lip they have. I begin with a larger block of soft clay, which I cover in water and then gradually pull into finer and finer lengths. During this process, if I ever feel that my hand is becoming too dry or the clay is becoming too dry, I immediately dunk my hand back into the water before I start pulling again, as it's when either component becomes too dry that one will stick to the other and you'll rip the length of clay or the handle away from the pot. Once I have my longer length of clay, I separate them into individual handle blanks like so which are then piled one on top of the other, which just keeps them from drying out too much. I find using softer clay helps when pulling handles like this, although admittedly, 
as the handles of these were so thin, the whole process was a bit of a challenge. To attach the handles, I score an area about a finger's width down from the rim, and then I just dabbed it with some water, which essentially does the same thing as slip. As I'm attaching very soft handle blanks, I don't really have to use all that much slip or water to attach them. I then very gently clasp around the handle blank, making sure that my fingers don't distort the length, and I tap out one of the ends. The tapped out end simply provides material which I can easily blend into the join. But I should note, as I push the handle onto the cup's form, I'm really trying to make sure that there's no air trapped in between the two. So I push very firmly, and sometimes I wiggle the clay as I'm pushing to really smear it in place. Once the handle's firmly attached, I blend in that tapped out clay all the way around the handle. This helps to secure the length of clay in place for when I pull it again. And this is why it's important to tap out one end, because it provides material that you can blend into the cup. If you were to try to blend in clay without a tapped out end, you end up taking material from the handle itself and thinning out the join, which will basically make it weak and more susceptible to being ripped off as you're pulling. Or it'll simply leave you with a handle that looks very weak around the top join. And really what we're trying to do here is to pull a length of clay that's the same thickness the entire way from top to the bottom. Much like the walls of a pot being thrown, you don't want the walls to be uneven or have any inconsistencies. And the same applies for handles too. Pulling these handles was an altogether different experience from the usual ones that I make on my mugs or coffee cups. With those, I can sort of let the weight of my hand do a lot of the pulling work. But with these, I'm sure if I worked as robustly, I would have likely just ripped them clean off. Anyway, once I've pulled the length, I loop it down and carefully secure it near the base of the pot, before spending some time smearing the clay in either side to secure the bottom join in place. I also then use a wetted finger just to rub over some of the finger marks and to make them a little bit neater. I'd say with handles, once they've been freshly pulled, it's better not to touch them that much until they've firmed up a little bit, as the chances are likely that you'll just distort it or make it worse. So at this stage I really try to not overwork them, but once they're leather hard and if they happen to need a little bit of cleaning up, that's when I'll do it. But these look pretty good, and generally speaking, I try not to touch a handle beyond this point until it's been fired, as I love the look of a freshly pulled handle. They have so much life to them. Then, for a brief moment, I let them dry upside down. This way the nice spring the handles have isn't lost, as if you were to let them dry the right way up there's a chance the handle could sag slightly as it does so. I only made 10 of these cups in my first batch, with 5 or 6 or so set to be in the exhibition, but now that I've fired them, and I'm very happy with them too, I might add them to my repertoire of pots and begin making larger batches, which I'm very happy about, as it means I'll get to practice a lot more pulling very thin, fine handles. My hand on the inside of the form is important here, as it braces the pressure that's exerted from the outside of the form as I firmly push the handle into place. The clay from the tapped out end is then blended into the cup's body, and I'm never pushing too hard really during this process, as the walls of the cup are relatively easy to distort. It's all done in a fine balance, really, as you need to work with enough vigour to get things done quickly, but with enough delicacy as not to deform or damage the piece you're working on. I then take a wetted hand and very carefully and gradually pull the clay out from the very top of the join all the way to the bottom of the handle, bit by bit. This isn't a process to rush. Speed simply comes with experience, although you do need to work with some haste, because as you pull and as you get that length of clay wetter, the clay will slowly degrade and lose strength, and strength is needed for the handle to hold its nice spring once looped and joined at the base and that becomes even more prevalent when working with such thin lengths like this. The angle in which the handle joins at the base means that I don't need to score and slip it. I can simply snip away the excess clay and then smear away what little excess there is either side. And as you see here, I'm just using a wetted finger just to give the handle a little bit more lift. Again, I won't try and do any drastic changes at this point. If I were to do so, I'll wait a little bit until the handle is firmed up. And these final, finishing touches are done so just to neaten up the bottom join, but I try as I might to avoid touching the actual looped length handle itself, as I don't want to mark or damage those delicately pulled lines that are left in the handle 
from when I pulled it, which I like to leave as remnants from my hand, maker's marks, so to speak, which eventually will be held by someone else. That's why I like pulled handles so much, as you don't use any tools when you're making them. Their shape is created from the wet hand that pulls them, and my thumb leaves three scored lines along their back. They're personal, I think, and they give a lot of character to the pots they're put onto. But I think put onto is maybe the wrong word, as a nicely pulled handle looks as if it is always meant to be there. They flow out of the pot, almost growing from it, and the hand pulled nature of them matches the hand thrown aspect of the pots too. Anyhow, that's just my approach to handles, and it's why I choose to make them in this specific way. Yet, this doesn't mean that it's the best way of making handles. I suppose one of the aspects that makes pottery so great is the sheer amount of different ways you can do more or less the same task. There are dozens of ways of making handles, and this is but one technique. Anyway, I fired these up in reduction last week and pulled a few of them out of the kiln last Friday. I know that some of you were waiting for a gas firing video, and hopefully I'll be able to edit that together for next Sunday. It's been a busy few weeks glazing and firing. Thereafter I'll spend some time packing my work for the exhibition, and finally preparing work for another big online shop restock on my website, which may just include a handful of these cups. And I think this picture shows quite nicely the thinness of the handle in comparison to the fine edge of the lip. I wanted each to echo the other, and I think I did a pretty okay job for my first attempt, but there are certainly some improvements I can make for the next batch. Anyhow, that's all for this week. Stick around if you want to see a little blooper, but otherwise, I'll see you next time.